Hello and welcome to Caregivers First, the show brought to you by SCAN, helping active adults stay informed and empowered. My name is Lavelle Jones. Thank you so much for joining us. Veterans Day is November 11th, so it's fitting that the topic for our show today is caregiving and veterans. There are 5.5 million military and veteran caregivers in the United States today. These voluntary, uncompensated caregivers provide $14 billion in service for wounded warriors each year. Our discussion will explore the military and veterans caregivers journey and highlight some available resources and supports. I am so delighted to welcome to the show, Amy Goyer. Amy is the author of Juggling Life, Work and Caregiving. She's a nationally known writer, speaker and consultant, specializing in caregiving and family issues. Amy serves as AARP's national family and caregiving expert, columnist and spokesperson. And she also moderates AARP's Facebook Family Caregivers Discussion Group. Her columns and caregiving YouTube series share her personal caregiving journey as well as practical, actionable tips for caregivers. She's a passionate champion for family caregivers and has been one her entire adult life, caring for her grandparents, parents, and sisters. Amy's grandfather served in World War I, World War II, and the Korean War, and her father served in World War II and the Korean War. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Lavelle. It's great to be here with you. Oh, we are delighted to have you. In fact, we are so fortunate to have the benefit of your insights that I'm going to get right into our discussion because I don't want to waste one minute. So thank you again for being here. Amy, you have um, just incredible experience in uh, caregiving. So I think what I'd like to ask you first is just to tell us a bit about your own personal caregiving experience and uh, perhaps whether you have also cared for veterans. Yes, as a matter of fact, I've been a family caregiver my entire adult life, starting in my 20s when I was still in college. My parents moved from uh, in Ohio to Arizona, and my grandparents were all in Indiana. My dad in particular was an only child, so my grandparents on my dad's side were, you know, really didn't have as much support from anyone else. So I ended up doing a lot of the hands-on um, arranging for services. They were six and a half hours away from me. So I got my first experience as a long distance caregiver. My dad managed the finances and that sort of thing from the distance. And I uh, had, I was, got a degree in music therapy. So I was starting to work in the field of aging, even doing field work in college. And then after college, I worked in adult daycare centers and nursing homes and for the Ohio Department of Aging. So I was working in the field. So it made sense that I was kind of the one to start doing those things. I got them Meals on Wheels. I got them uh, services, home health aides. My grandmother developed Alzheimer's disease. So mm -hmm. my granddaddy, who, as you mentioned, had served in the military, was a career. He retired from the Air Force. And my grandmother had always taken care of him. Well, the tables were turned. And he did an amazing job, but didn't really know how to handle much. So I, you know, I taught him how to deal with incontinence and how to uh, get services at home. And we, we got all of those things in place. Now, back then, there wasn't a lot of support from the VA for caregivers. And I, I don't recall really the VA being much of a factor in their care. My grandparents wanted to stay at home. And then as my grandfather aged, he had needed help as well. And they ran out of money and there was no Medicaid waiver at the time for in-home services in Indiana. So they had to go to a nursing facility, which was heartbreaking for me and my, and my family. And my grandmother died in four weeks, my grandfather six weeks later. Oh. He was 98 years old oh. and she was 88. So it was quite a learning experience. Um, my, my, as I said, my grandfather was career military. He was, it was a huge part of his life and his personality. And we did everything to kind of nurture that. But I was dedicated that would be kind of different with my parents. Yes. My mom had a stroke when she was only 63. So in the middle of all the grandparent caregiving, and I also helped with my other grandmother, my mom had the stroke at 63. So my dad became her primary caregiver as well. So then my sisters and I were sort of supporting for him, respite, 
over the years, my dad had a hip replacement and I telecommuted for a month taking care of them. Flash forward, my dad developed Alzheimer's disease, oh. just like his mom. Now, daddy had served in World War II and he was in the 10th Mountain Division, uh, which was the group that came in at the end of the war in Italy and drove the Nazis out of the Alps and surrendered in Italy. And then a few days later in all of Europe. So I always say my dad ended World War II. <laughs> and we so- In my mind. Service. Yes, yes, yes. But his military service, when he retired, he was a, a college professor. Um, he had been recalled during the Korean War and he and my mom were stationed in Germany then. So he had really military, his military service wasn't really a big part of his life. But when he retired, he got very involved as an AARP volunteer, but also with his veterans group, the 10th Mountain Division Veterans. And he was the state president many times and he was just very involved. Um, they traveled to Italy and retraced his path um, during the war. And I, when, when we, I started caregiving for my parents, first long distance from Washington, D.C. to Arizona, uh, and then later I moved to uh, Arizona to take care of them and be closer to them. They lived in a, in a uh, senior community yes. for three years with some assistance, but my mom fell and fractured her spine and, and had a heart attack and had multiple problems, 40 days in, a, in, a, in the hospital and rehab. And then my dad's Alzheimer's got worse. So I moved them back in the house with me. So then I became a live-in caregiver and they lived with me. My mom passed away sadly just a year later and my dad was with me for six years. Um, he passed away at the age of 94, just two years ago. And I was very happy to have him at home and um, he died very peacefully in his sleep. My sisters and I were all there. And, you know, they're, they're, as I said, I wanted it to be different for them than it was for my grandparents. And the other way it was different is that my dad had a lot of support from the VA. I got him enrolled in VA healthcare. He got hearing aids and hearing devices. He got eventually at home-based primary care where a team, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, doctors when needed. We had home health aides who came and helped him get uh, out of bed in the morning, get dressed. We had medical equipment, ramps, uh, a rolling shower chair. Uh, we had his medications, incontinent supplies, medical supplies, truly, truly made a huge difference for us. So this topic today that we're talking about and my work with AARP's Veteran and Military Families Initiative is really important to me. It's a personal mission to make sure that veteran and military caregivers get the support that they need and that their loved ones deserve. That is terrific. Uh, you just shared uh, so many wonderful things with us, Amy. And um, first of all, it sounds like you have had uh, literally decades of experience with, with caregiving. And it, your, your experience has been so broad because uh, you, know, you have experienced what it, what it is to be a caregiver from a distance. You've also experienced what it is when you make moves in your own life so that you can continue to caregive. And all of what you've just said reminds me of something that I heard recently and I, I thought it, it's a beautiful thought. We were discussing caregiving and it, it, it was said that, you know, caregiving is not an obligation, it's a gift. It's a gift to those who are caring for loved ones. So uh, listening to your story, um, I think certainly emphasizes that. I do wanna ask you before I go to my next question, do you think that your training and education and background in the issues that are particularly relevant to um, older people, do you think that helped you uh, in uh, maybe assessing and managing what needed to be done for your own family? Absolutely. It, and, and my knowledge just of the systems and what kind of supports might be available. And um, I think because of my work, I'm a very strong advocate, I'm an advocate for others, and therefore those skills transferred into my own personal caregiving experience. Uh, and, and I can also tell you that no matter, even though I have, this is my profession, it was very, very hard for me. So, uh, you know, and, and, and during all that, I was also caregiving for my sister long distance and she passed away a year after my mom did. So uh, being pulled in so many different directions, working full time, traveling for work, 
um, managing everyone's care. And then I managed all of their estates as well. You know, I, I, I really try to get across to caregivers that, you know, yes, this is, I have this professional background that helps me. And it was still really, really hard. Yes. So please don't feel like you're a failure if this is challenging for you. Thank you for sharing that, Amy. I think um, that's important for all caregivers uh, to hear. You uh, mentioned uh, supports that um, may not have been available, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and you also mentioned your work with AARP. So I'd like to ask you, what types of uh, supports are there for caregivers um, from AARP? Well, you know, AARP has about 4 million members who are veterans. So veterans are extremely important to AARP and AARP provides free resources and important timely information and timely programming and the, the, on, on many key topics, and caregiving being one of them, but also fraud through Operation Protect Veterans and the Fraud Watch Network and recareering and work and jobs. All of these issues uh, are important as, as well as financial security and retirement savings. Now, my area of expertise is family caregiving, as you say, and AARP um, has, you know, you mentioned 5.5 million vet military and veteran caregivers, and the value of that being $14 billion, uh, and that's unpaid care, you know, part of one of the things AARP wants to do is to really really um, honor all these caregivers and make sure that people understand the value, but also to help them. Um, so AARP has is, is put together quite a few great resources for family caregivers and especially veteran family caregivers. Terrific, thank you. And I, I wanna follow up on um, uh, some of uh, your experience. You mentioned some of the, the, the things that you did for your, your loved ones when you cared for them. Um, what are the kinds of things that our military and veterans caregivers do. Uh, you know, take us through what may be some of the universal things, whether it's you know helping with with grooming or uh, you know going to appointments. Walk us through that a bit, if you could. Well, you kind of heard from my experience the kind of the wide range where you, you might just be checking in with someone to make sure they're okay, kind of checking on that monitor their mood. You know, everyone's isolated, especially now during the pandemic. But even before that, you know, many older adults, many people with disabilities, people are isolated. So that you are a caregiver if you are doing those sorts of things and providing emotional support and socialization and ensuring that they're getting cognitive stimulation, that you're, you're a caregiver. But also more practical things like providing transportation. That's a very common role is taking people to doctor's appointments or shopping, helping out at home or in the yard. You know, it gets chores get kind of harder for people many times. Managing medications is a big one. You know, I remember my mom had at one point 23 medications with creams and nose sprays and pills and everything. Yes. So it's, it's a lot to manage. And um, it, um, I, I appreciate your mentioning the managing medications because that is a, a major part of caregiving. What I would like to do, because I, I don't want to skimp on this discussion, we're going to take a quick break right now. And when we come back, we're going to pick up on managing medications and other things that caregivers do. So to our audience, please stick with us. We'll be right back. You probably already know that rehabilitation is a must for successful recovery from surgery, injury, or serious illness. What you may not know is that you're free to choose where you go for rehab. In Monmouth and Ocean County, the compelling choice is Care One. Where you choose to go for rehab matters, and with Care One, you have four convenient locations to choose from in Monmouth and Ocean Counties. Care One at Jackson, Care One at Wall, Care One at Homedale, and Care One at King James in the Atlantic Highlands. At Care One, you'll work with a team of experts to develop a plan based on your needs and goals. You'll have the full support of caring, compassionate physicians, RNs, licensed therapists, and nutritionists dedicated to helping you recover successfully without setbacks at a pace that makes you comfortable and successful in 
meeting your rehabilitation goals. Once you take the first step with us, you'll never look back. Call 877-99-CARE-1 today and come for a tour. Welcome back to Caregivers First. We are talking with Amy Goyer, AARP's National Family Caregiving Expert. Before the break, we were talking about some of the things that military and veterans caregivers do. And Amy, I'd like to pick up where we left off. We started talking about a big one, which is managing medications. Fill us in a little bit more on that and any other activities. You know, managing medications can be one of the biggest challenges because we get this feeling like our loved one's lives depend on us if they get the medications wrong or if there is a drug or an interaction that we miss. So I, I always have found that that to be one of the more pressure filled ones. The nice thing is now there are all kinds of services that can send you pill packets already, already organized or there are uh, pill organizers and you can even have uh, someone come to the house and administer medications. So that is a, a big part of caregiving for many people, but also people get into to more um, complex nursing and, and medical tasks like caring for wounds. Uh, wound care can be is incredibly stressful because it, some of them, it's very distressing to see your loved ones have these wounds and often when they don't heal, uh, you try everything you can. And so we had great support actually from the VA, from our, our nurse practitioner and our, and our nurse. Um, we've had new wound care nurses that also help as well. That's great. The That's other thing is um, assistive devices. You know, people help with walkers and wheelchairs oh, yes. and, uh, you know, all kinds of medical equipment, um, activities of daily living. So, you know, that's, you know, getting bathing, dressing, toileting, eating, um, and, and uh, the instrumental activities of day, daily living, uh, transportation, which we talked about. And then, you know, last but not least, is just that role as an advocate. You know, I, I talked about that, that, you know, you advocate for your loved ones to get the care that that you should expect that they deserve to, you know, more and more, we have to be our own advocates. And when we're sick, we can't do that. So you need someone else um, to be doing that, whether it's in person or from a distance, especially now during the pandemic. That's a, that's a really terrific point. And uh, uh, Amy, you uh, mentioned the pandemic. So I'd like to um, ask you a, a question. Um, as of November, uh, over 4,000 veterans in the country have actually uh, died of COVID-19. So um, I, I guess my question is, um, is there any information that we can offer to veteran caregivers that's specific to the current pandemic? Absolutely. You know, many veterans um, who are wounded, ill, or, or have injuries or have are older, are at more risk of getting very sick from the pandemic. So first of all, we, we really um, strongly encourage everyone to take all the necessary precautions and all of the safety measures that are, are supported by the CDC. AARP created a fact sheet to be helpful. And it, it goes through five ways to adjust your caregiving process because of the pandemic. The first one being, you know, how can you adjust your team? So that people, someone to run errands, someone to do the shopping. What's your backup plan if someone gets ill? So we have some suggestions around that. As we've talked about medications and medical visits, you know, making sure they have plenty of prescriptions on hand, um, helping with telehealth appointments. I think that's one of the biggest changes with the pandemic is, uh, and I spoke with someone today who said, you know, now that I'm doing telehealth visits, why would I ever want to go in the office? <laughs> you know, yes. and I think that will be a change going forward, but it isn't always easy to, until you're used to it. So caregivers, we have some tips around that. And in fact, AARP has a whole section on the website now on telehealth. We've got how-to videos and instructions and lots of tips. The other thing is uh, staying connected. So everyone is like, you know, everyone's isolated and caregivers are isolated even yeah. before the pandemic. So now even more so. So we really need to have a plan around that um, for socialization, socialization, for making connections, uh, whether it's setting up for video chats and video calls, 
uh, making the technology easy for someone who struggles with it, uh, sending more um, mail things in the mail, cards and letters, um, more frequent phone calls. I think frequency has to be increased because of this. Might mm -hmm. be you know you, you called your dad you know once a week before, but now you need to do it more often, right? Exactly. And last but not least is personal safety and self care. So just, you know, how do you handle visitors? How, you know, getting plenty of rest, stress relief, you know, stress uh, and isolation are detrimental to our health. And so we have to have uh, a plan in place for ourselves and our loved ones to stay connected. And that fact sheet, it's called Supporting Military Veterans and Family Caregivers During the Pandemic. You can get that at aarp.org slash veterans. And it's available in English and Spanish. That is terrific. Thank you. Uh, that's wonderful information, Amy. And um, let's stay on the topic of um, uh, supports for uh, caregivers that can be found at uh, AARP. There, AARP also uh, provides uh, a veterans and military guide or military and veterans guide. Um, tell us uh, what is that guide all about and how can it be um, helpful to caregivers? Right, it's a veteran and military caregiving guide. So it's focused for the caregivers to help them deal with um, the various aspects of caregiving and it has lots of great resources specifically for veteran and military caregivers. So it goes through five issues, you know, the conversations that you need to have about health and finances and your loved one's wishes and resources. Your team, as I mentioned before, you know, you gotta have a caregiving team and how to build that team, uh, how to make a plan. And, uh, you know, I always say we have to have a plan even though the plan will change. So just, you know, know that from the start, but it's your framework that you go back to. And when, when one aspect changes, you go back to your plan and you say, okay, how do we stick to our goals and wishes and adjust? And then seeking professional support. And we have lots of suggestions on that. And of course, caring for yourself, the caregiver, which is paramount. And, and it's certainly last but not least. Um, we, the guide also has a glossary of terms, which I don't know about you, Lavelle, but it found, I found it very helpful Again, my grandfather was career military, but my dad wasn't. So it wasn't a big part of my life. And I didn't know the terminology at all, you know, especially the, the DD-214 and the different terms that the VA uses. So that's really helpful. We have other resources. We have a needs assessment, a lot of checklists in there, you know, uh, a personal information, home maintenance, you know, oh gosh, I'm taking care of this person and they're living in their own home. And I've got to think about, if they can't take care of their home, how do we take care of that? You know, as well as making medication lists and financial matters and public benefits and VA benefits. You know, it there sounds like a it sounds like a, a very comprehensive guide that you know really touches on so many things. So thank you for uh, sharing that. And again, it, it's called the uh, AARP Veteran and Military Caregiving Guide. Yes, and you can get that at aarp.org/veterans also. Okay, that, that's terrific. Uh, Amy, you mentioned a little while ago uh, the issue of uh, isolation. And um, you also mentioned that uh, as we uh, think about caregivers taking care of others, that caregivers also need to take care of themselves. And I, I think that's an important point that I wanna make sure we, we emphasize. And uh, I have another question for you. It, how can friends, help caregivers. Uh, you know, uh, there are uh, many of us who uh, perhaps uh, are not caregivers ourselves, but we have friends um, who are. And, you know, sometimes as friends, we, we may wonder, you know, what can I do to help? Do you have any insight there, Amy? Absolutely. You know, my philosophy on self-care that I developed out of practicality when I was in the throes of caregiving for three people all over the country, was I realized it's very practical. It's not, it's not you know, selfish to take care of ourselves. And I realized that my car can't run on empty and neither can I, so I have to fill up. And, and often you can't just fill up your whole tank at once when you're a caregiver, you don't have time. And you get to do a lot of little things. And that's where friends can really be helpful. So it's a quick phone call. It's sending a text, how are you doing today? Um, it's offering to do things, uh, grocery shopping. Uh, prepare a meal and drop it off. 
uh, find, do, do online research. That's one thing that, you know, I, you just, there's so much you're trying to figure out and treatments and, um, and doctors and all kinds of things. Somebody else can go online and do some of that research for you. So there's practical things that friends can do. And then there's the emotional support and the moral support. I have my, my best friend. I don't know what I would have done without her. I could call her any time of day or night and cry or vent or share a joy or a triumph. And she got it all the time. Amy, in the uh, uh, about a minute and a half uh, time left uh, for the show, I do want to ask you a question. You mentioned earlier uh, the VA. How can caregivers make sure that their loved ones are getting the benefits that they're entitled to and how should they be working uh, with the VA? Uh, I think one of the most important resources is the VA Caregiver Support Program. And they have a, a website, it's caregiver.va.gov. You can go there, um, they have a toll-free number there, et cetera, where you can speak with someone and explain your situation and try and find out what benefits your, your loved ones might be uh, eligible for, what services they might receive. Um, in some cases, caregivers can be paid to provide care for loved ones who are veterans. So be sure to look into all the possibilities. Terrific, thank you so much. And uh, again, I want to um, make sure that we emphasize a couple of things. One, that uh, caregivers need to remember to take care of themselves. Uh, we also uh, you know, need to remember that uh, you know, caregiving is something that is a team effort in so many, so many ways. And um, Amy, I'd like to uh, give you the opportunity to uh, close out the show with any uh, lasting comments you wanna leave with our audience today. Well, I would just echo what you say, you know, it's, it's not selfish, it's practical. We have, we have to fill up so that we can give. So be sure to do that and take care of yourself. And I want to make sure that people go to aarp.org slash veterans for information and resources for veterans and for veteran caregivers and to aarp.org slash caregiving, where we have so many resources, tips, tools, videos for care, all sorts of caregivers uh, on every matter. And then the one last thing I wanna add is I moderate AARP's Facebook Family Caregivers Discussion Group. And I encourage you all to join the group if you are on Facebook. And uh, it's, a, it's a place where you can vent and get support and ask questions. We, we have a lot of veteran caregivers in there as well. So please um, join me there. I'll look forward to seeing you. Wonderful. Amy, thank you so much. This has been an incredibly enlightening discussion. And I thank you for being here. And I do hope that you'll visit us again in the future. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thanks so thank much. Well. Thank you so much, Amy. And many thanks to our viewers for joining us today. I do hope that you found the information relevant and useful. As always, if you did, please share it with your family and friends. And don't forget to join us for the next edition of Caregivers First. Until then, stay safe and take care.